So we want to welcome everyone um, back to the Bonavio University Training Center. We're um, very excited to be with you. I know a lot of you have been anxiously awaiting our recorded video from last week on Thursday and Friday. Um, but as you can imagine, um, we had quite a few updates that happened over this weekend. Um, in addition to uh, the SBA IDLE loans being uh, and their application being changed around 10 o'clock last night. Um, today is Monday, March 30th. And so we felt it would be best if we actually did another recording um, and informed you of all the changes um, that we're aware of as of this point. Um, as previously introduced, my name is Lynn uh, Musensky Keck. I'm a partner in the Bonadio Group at our Rochester office. And we are located in Rochester, New York, and we do indeed support the social distancing that is being required by us um, and, and support of, of flattening the curve. And so in the room with me, but you cannot see them, uh, but they will um, come up here um, as, as we go through the slide deck, includes um, our other previous presenter, um, Jason Acker, who's a principal in our SBA Rochester group, and then also Mark Valerio, who is a partner in our Rochester commercial group. And um, over the past three to four days, we've kind of um, worked all together um, to make sure we're getting our hands wrapped around this for our clients and for the public, um, again, in our, in our way that we can contribute um, to this ongoing pandemic. Um, so today, um, there are a few things we wanted to update you on, as we spoke about earlier last week, um, that we weren't quite sure if we could apply for multiple loans at the same time or receive multiple loans. So on this first slide, what you're going to see is this is a direct poll from Senator Schumer's um, CARES Guide, um, and they make very clear that indeed um, you can apply to both um, what they refer to the PPP loan, which, which is the um, Paychecks Protection Program loan under the CARES Act, which is the primary loan um, that we introduced last week to you. But in addition to that, if you qualify, you can also apply for the SBA loans. Um, under economic injury disaster loans, or what you'll often hear us refer to as idle loans. Um, so uh, they also make clear that if you are available to any 504 loans or microloans, um, you could also apply for those as well. So essentially, not only can you apply for them, um, but uh, you can also uh, receive money from both those loans and utilize them. Uh, the only item that we would say be careful of, and as we go through here, uh, we'll highlight it even more, is that when you do indeed, if you receive a PPP loan, which is often referred to as the CARES loan, or an SBA IDLE loan, that you make sure to use the funds from the PPP loan in the proper um, ways we're allowed to, to ensure debt forgiveness. And that has to do with your expenditures for the first eight weeks after the loan origination fee. Um, so it is very important um, that we track that and we make sure that we're using the PPP loan funds for the first eight weeks after the loan origination fee for certain expenses, which we'll talk about in just a second. However, if you also receive an idle loan, you can use that loan after you deplete your PPP loan on those items. Um, the next slide is just, again, re, uh, reconfirming that. Indeed, um, I, we just want to make it very clear because it is extremely important, extremely beneficial, um, especially because all of New York State um, is, was declared a, a disaster area for purposes of idle. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you understand that you are able to apply for both uh, the PPP CARES loan and the idle loan. Um, at this time, we are going to do a little brief review about the CARES PPP loan or Paychecks Protection Program loan. Um, again, uh, we would just highlight that uh, the banks are aware. Um, we're going to have a bank update in a little bit about, um, indeed, that they have the right um, and have designated the authority under the Small Business Administration channels um, that they, indeed, can provide loans um, on behalf of the SBA. In addition, um, when evaluating the borrower, they have been restricted to only looking at two, fi or two things besides um, the employee account, which we'll talk about in just a second. One has to do with, uh, was the business entity in operation as of February 15th of 2020? And the other has to do with, do, do they indeed have employees um, in whom they paid salaries or paid independent contractors? Again, the covered period of when you can go after these um, CARES PPP loans um, start, started on February 15th and will end on June 30th. It includes small business concerns, 
Um, I'm going to clarify that point. Um, we, we've had a lot of questions coming in on that. Um, essentially, a small business concern was previously defined under the Small Business Administration. Um, so if you would have qualified as a small business concern under the Small Business Administration Act uh, or Article 7A, then you indeed uh, would be available for the PPP loan. However, um, the Senate bill, the CARES bill, expanded that to say not only do those people qualify for the PPP loan, but also any business concern, nonprofit organization, veterans organization, or tribal business, um, provided that the employees are not the greater of 500 employees or the size standard um, that was issued by the SBA for that particular industry. Um, again, uh, we put that out there. Um, I will give you an example now um, that we see that, um, for example, in food manufacturing, um, you might not necessarily qualify under the small business concerns previous definition under the Small Business Administration, um, but you would now potentially qualify for the PPP loan um, because you are deemed a business concern and um, you fall under the either the 500 employee count or actually if you look at the size standard for some food manufacturing industries, um, it can go up as far as 1,000 or 1,250. Um, so that is definitely something don't count yourself out if you're above the 500 employee. See if that um, size standard um, for the industry is relevant. Um, real quickly, again, um, we should be looking at our average totally monthly, monthly payments regarding to our payroll costs. And once we get to that monthly um, payroll cost average, we're going to multiply that by 2.5. Um, and that, in general, or $10 million is going to be the limit of your loan. Um, you will notice there is a bullet point in between there um, that if you had an outstanding loan amount from January 31st to the time in which you got the PPP loan, those can be refinanced into the PPP loan. But we want to make sure we make it clear to you uh, upon further investigation that we found that that outstanding loan amount must be an outstanding loan amount from the Small Business Administration, okay? So it does not include um, a general, me going to the bank um, in, the middle of, um, in the middle of February and obtaining a loan. It has to be a Small Business Administration loan that you received after January 31st that now can be rolled into your PPP loan. Um, we've also fielded a fair amount of questions uh, from seasonal employers. Um, do be aware that um, certain specific rules exist for you. Um, a quick overview of payroll costs. So remember, when determining our loan amount, we're going to take two and a half times our payroll costs. Payroll costs include uh, the obvious salary and wages, um, but we do want to point out for the restaurant industry, it also includes the payment of cash tip or equivalent. So if you looked at your prior 12 months and you could figure out your recorded tips, your average uh, monthly tips, that could be included in your payroll costs. Um, in addition, it also includes um, payments required for your employers for purposes of, or employees, I should say, for purposes of your group health care benefits, as well as payment of any retirement benefits, in addition to any state or local um, withholding taxes you might be making on behalf of your employees. The other big item that we've fielded a fair amount of questions from is indeed um, for purposes of determining your payroll costs to understand your maximum PPP loan, you can look at your sole proprietor or independent contractors that you pay, um, and that can increase the um, monthly average payroll costs, which would ultimately increase your loan amount. Um, the other point I would also raise is that while employers can take out um, a loan um, for under the PPP program, um, it would uh, not be fair to me not to point out that also sole proprietors or independent contractors can as well. Lots of questions have flooded in regarding if I'm a sole proprietor, how do I, I don't get a payroll, what do I show to compensate the loan? Um, under the Senate guidance and, and the bill that was passed, they said you would show your income and your expenses, um, and essentially that would help create your monthly average payroll costs, even though you officially don't have um, a, a wage W-2. Um, things to point out, um, payroll costs cannot include um, any average um, monthly salary if that would go above an annual salary of 100000 So essentially the maximum amount of payroll that can come into that payroll cost average, monthly average for purposes of determining the loan amount 
is going to be limited to 100,000 divided by 12. Um, in addition, um, any FICA, Social Security and Medicare, that might be paid on behalf of the employee um, should not come in. Um, the principal place of residence of the employee has to be in the United States for us to count their payroll. And we spent a fair amount of time last week saying that if you received a payroll credit under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act for the expanded sick leave or the expanded family uh, medical leave, indeed, um, that would also not be included in your payroll costs. Um, just again, reminding you that there are good faith certifications that you'll have to make under the PP program. You can read through those, um, but nothing um, that is too surprising. For the loan forgiveness, um, we just want to point out again um, that for the loan forgiveness, it really is determined now that you've received the loan um, from the date of the origination date. To be specific, you have to look at eight weeks out and prove essentially that you've been paying payroll costs, which we previously just covered. Um, that you've been paying interest on any covered mortgage obligation, which is a mortgage obligation that you received on real or personal property prior to February 15th, and any payment of a rent obligation made um, under a leasing agreement before 2-15, um, 2020. I will point out we've gotten a lot of questions about what about related party rent obligations and do I have to have a, a written lease agreement. Um, the first question regarding a written lease agreement um, my, my friends in the cost segregation world would say, absolutely, you need a written lease agreement for a variety of um, depreciation reasons. Um, but also, I think it's just good practice, especially um, for loan forgiveness, that you show that you had a written lease agreement prior to February 15th. As far as related party payments, uh, we have seen no um, distinction um, in the um, in the CARES Act between non-related versus related party rent obligations. That does not mean clarification might not come out later, but at this time we see no distinction. In addition, any utility payments um, that were um, in relation to electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet um, before February 15th. Don't forget that documentation for from the loan origination date to eight weeks out um, needs to be kept in order for you to submit that to the banks in order to get the loan forgiveness. If you have no documentation, um, there's a high potential you won't be able to get forgiven for the loan. I'm just going to pause here for a second. We've got a lot of questions about really they're going to give us loan forgiveness. I'll get a lot of people anxious that that's not really going to happen. Um, all I can say to you is the way that the bill is written and it was passed and the way that the banks are interpreting it is it will. OK, um, you're not going to get saddled at the end of this with a huge loan um, because you applied for the PPP loan. Um, we will point out that the PPP loan is very specific to the loan forgiveness and the idle loan doesn't have loan forgiveness. They have an advancement, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but the loan forgiveness really falls under the PPP loan. Um, and again, if we take a 10,000 foot view, which is sometimes hard to be doing right now, um, the reason for this is essentially and remember, it's called the Payroll Protection Program. They want you to keep your employees on the payroll um, at least for the next eight weeks, right? Um, and so to do that, um, essentially, they're giving the government is fronting your payroll. I mean, that's essentially what's going on here. Um, so I just want to give you as much confidence as we have that the government does have any and every intention to forgive that debt. Again, um, timing of the loan forgiveness, once you provide all the documentation, the banks have 60 days to get back to you on the amount of loan forgiveness. Give, forgiveness. We do find that documentation is going to be key in this area. So please make sure when you're working with your banks or with your advisors, you're getting told what documentation is necessary. And we have received a lot of questions regarding, is the debt forgiveness going to be taxable to me? And so we're just repeating to you that indeed, based under the, the CARES Act, which was passed, it is very clear that any debt forgiveness would not create taxability um, from a federal income step tax uh, perspective. Last um, but not least, um, we have had a fair amount of questions regarding the amount of reduction of the loan forgiveness. So let's say, for example, when I look, I have $100,000 of my monthly average salary. I multiply it by 2.5, and I have $250,000 of a CARES PPP loan. Now I'd like to get a loan forgiveness. 
So now I do what I've been instructed to do. I receive the loan today. I go out eight weeks. I track my payroll. I track my monthly um, interest payments. I track my um, covered utility, et cetera. Shouldn't I receive the entire loan forgiveness back? Right? That's the question. Or where will I? And we would point out that essentially what the, the government is requesting is that from that day in which you receive the loan forgiveness, and if you go out eight weeks, they're going to have you measure what we call in the tax world, um, which was highlighted under the Affordable Care Act, something called full-time employee equivalents. Okay? And they're going to have you compare that to full-time employee equivalents that were measured between February 5th, 15th of 2019 and June 30th of 2019 in your operations or January 1st of 2020 ending on February 29th of 2020. You're going to take the smallest number of FTEEs during those two periods I just suggested. So let's say that during the eight weeks my employee count, FTEE count is 50. Okay? And let's say that during those two time periods my employee count was 100. So I'm down 50%, right? So essentially what they've written in the bill is if your FTEE during the eight weeks in which you had the loan was down 50% compared to the FTEE equivalent during these specific time periods, then we're going to reduce your loan by 50% in my example. Now, the one thing that we have seen um, and that we've been having a lot of internal debate about here is it seems that this reduction of the loan amount um, may potentially be waived if by the time you hit June 30th of 2020, you're back up to your full FTEE count, your full-time employee equivalent. If you read the bill, they say we will ignore the reduction in the loan forgiveness provided you ramp back up to 100% of your employee count, your F full-time employee equivalent count by June 30th. Some people say, well, why would they do that? Where they're doing that, the whole bill, remember, is to keep people on your payroll or have people in your business ready to go when the economy is ready to go. And essentially, that's what they're trying to highlight here, is that by June 30th of 2020, they're expecting the economy to be ready to go. And they want to make sure the employees are in place to get it there. The last thing I would point out, um, regarding um, the reduction in uh, forgiveness of loans might also occur if you cut your, um, your employee's salary greater than 25%. And when they talk about your employee's salary here, they're only talking about your employees who annually make $100,000 or less. So they're watching that market, they're watching those employees, and they want to make sure you don't cut their salary more than 25%. If you do, there would be potential consequences. Before we stop and go into the comparison chart, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to ask um, Jason or Mark if there's any other items that they would want to point out about the ability to use the PPP and the IDA loans um, or about any of the items we just raised about the PPP loan. Lynn, I know how much you love my questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a, a question. Yay. Um, so self-employed, sole proprietor. We saw the account for determination of payroll. Yeah. Do they also count for FTE when determining forgiveness? So he had. So Mark's question is essentially saying, um, if I use an independent contractor to help me in my business, do they count as one of my employees for purposes of the 500 employee count? Okay. When they look at the 500 employee count under the CARES bill, they define it for purposes of the PPP section that an employee is an employee who works full-time, part-time, or of the like, I think it says. And so essentially what I would highlight is that if I'm using an independent contractor, for any of us who have been in this world for a little bit, um, we're in the tax world, we, we know the difference between an employee and an employer relationship versus an independent contractor or 1099 miss relationship. And so while I may be able to include, or I am able to include the 1099 miss I would pay on every average month in my payroll count to determine my loan, those independent contractors would not be counted towards my employee 500 count for purposes of being able to get into the loan. Does that make sense, Mark? And if you are 
you qualify as a sole proprietor, yeah. you're self-employed, but you have no one, no W-2 payroll, you can still obtain the loan forgiveness piece of it at the end. Correct. So the question again was, uh, it's kind of interesting here, and I just and I and I hate to get into the nuance of it, but say that I am an employer and that I have employees, but I also have um, contractors that I use. Okay. When I go, and, and assuming I qualify under everything else, when I go to my bank and I say I'm applying for a PPP loan, not only do I get that payroll for my employees, monthly average payroll times 2.5, but I also can get it for my independent contractors. Now what's interesting though, is my independent contractor also has the right under this act to go into the bank and ask for um, a PPP loan himself. So you might sit there and say, well, geez, isn't that double dipping? Um, my, my point would be um, potentially, um, but the double dip would only occur if the employer paid the independent contractor with their PPP loans, and then the independent contractor got paid again with their PPP loan. And I, and I have to think um, that the, the employer might, be, uh, might not always be paying um, their independent contractor. Um, I think the intention was that they would be. I mean, that's why that was built into the bill. They're very concerned about the people who are in an employer and employee relationship having some type of income stream over the next eight weeks. So, Lynn, the one thing that I really want to point out is when it comes to analyzing CARES versus IDLE, you know, if you'll remember last week when we left off, we said, okay, there's a lot of great things about CARES, there's good things about IDLE. But at this point, we don't know if you can get both. We don't know if you can even apply for both. So while we went through the process of applying for an EIDL loan, we cautioned people, hey, you may not want to apply for this until we've got final clarity on the law. Now that we have final clarity, we know that you can apply for both and you can get funding under both. This is a great answer for us. Additionally, the SBA has greatly streamlined the process of applying for the EIDL loan. We'll go over that in a little bit, but it's now online only. The documentation requirements are a lot less than what we talked about last week. And there's a provision within EIDL that you can get a $10,000 advancement on your loan, which does not have to be paid back. It's essentially a grant. And you'll get that within 72 hours. So while well, last week we said there was some risk in applying to EIDL, at this point, I don't see any risk in applying for it. If you're eligible, go ahead and do it. Get online, fill out your application, and get the process started. And you can still go to your bank and get funding other, under CARES as well. Yeah, I think, and that's really one of the significant reasons of why we wanted to have this webinar tonight is to nail that point home. So thank you, Jason. It, it's so true. If you can, uh, if you can apply for IDLE, apply for it. It will not prohibit you from going into the PPP. Um, we're going to talk about comparisons. Um, but essentially, the only uh, the other nice thing about the IDLE program, which Jason um, pointed out, is if you apply to IDLE within 72 hours, as long as you certify that you're a company that should be able to apply, you are going to get $10,000. And within when you get that $10,000, um, essentially, there's no obligation to pay it back. And even if they deny your idle application, you still got the use of that $10,000. So to me, at this point, it seems somewhat of a no-brainer. Um, if you apply, if you can, I'm sure maybe we'll change our tune by the end of the week. <laughs> but at this point, it seems like a no-brainer to apply for the idle. Um, but and also the PPP because the PPP really allows you to get debt forgiveness. Um, and the idle, besides that $10,000. You don't get the debt forgiveness, but it still might be a very important money at a very reasonable interest rate to have for your business operations. And one thing to note, if you do apply for both and you get the $10,000 grant, your eventual loan forgiveness on the PPP loan would be reduced by that $10,000 because you already received that amount. Yeah. All great points. Um, I think at this point we're going to go into the comparison chart. Um, not to say we're not going to we're, we're not going to go into we're not going to go into read every single section word by word, but we'll talk about it at a broad level. Who provides the loan? I think we were very clear last week, and we will be again very clear this week. If you get a PPP CARES loan, you are getting it from your bank. Okay, and Mark is going to give us a little update on that in a little bit about how our banks are um, ramping up for this. 
Um, if you go after an idle loan, um, as Jason's already pointed out, we're going to be going through the idle loan um, through the Small Business Administration. Um, and, we'll t and they really have streamlined the process with that. In addition, what businesses qualify for the PPP, we've kind of hit it home, I'm not gonna go over it again. Um, the big thing, again, is um, if you are a small business con concern already under SBA, you're automatically in. Um, really what the PPP um, program under the CARES Act did was just expand it. Um, so maybe if you weren't a small business concern but were a business concern or not-for-profit and you can meet those employee thresholds, um, you're in. Um, from, a small, from an idle perspective, I would highlight um, that the CARES Act did, which we didn't talk about last week, but we are bringing to your attention, the CARES Act under Section 1110 did adjust um, some of the qualifications within the idle loan, which if you, in a good way. Okay. Um, essentially, um, under the CARES Act, they expanded the breadth to get under the idle, um, similarly to what we saw under the PPP loans, um, with the intention, I think, to mimic um, the PPP loan. So not punish um, um, one or the other, giving people the capability to go into both. So as you can see here, same definition as we talked about um, last week, the small business as defined by the SBA, small um, cooperatives, um, nonprofit organizations, et cetera. But the specific piece here is that um, under the CARES Act for the period between January 31st and December 31st this year, they've expanded it to mimic almost the PPP movement. So a business of not more than 500 employees, an individual who operates as a sole proprietorship. So now not only if you're a sole proprietorship can you get a PPP CARES loan, you can also get an idle loan. Um, a cooperative with not more than 500 employees, an ESOP with not more than 500 employees, or a tribal um, small business. Again, to be in the IDLE program, you must have a physical presence in the declared disaster area. All of New York State does. Um, we know a lot of people are listening who are in New York State. There is um, a, a disasterloan.sba.gov where you can go and you can um, analyze whether you're in a declared disaster state. Um, what businesses are ineligible, I, we've addressed that with the PPP CARES loan, it's just the opposite, right? So if you have more than 500 employees or if you have more than the SBA designate, designated size standard, that's generally what we would say. For the auto loans, um, they said certain um, agricultural organizations, unfortunately, such as farms, are not available. Organizations where 50% or greater owner is 60 days delinquent with their child support. Organizations where greater than 30% of their gross revenue is due to gambling, lobbying organizations, and governmental entities um, and entities controlled by a member of Congress are not available for the IDLE loan. For both the IDLE and the CARES loan, we have been receiving phone calls off the hook. Aggregation rules do apply. Okay? Um, the aggregation rules, if you ever read them, are extremely far reaching and very broad. And essentially, um, I feel like if they think there's aggregation, there is. Um, we don't know how strict they are going to be about enforcing those aggregation rules. Um, they are, meaning the ones that are in the gray area. The one that is not in the gray area is simply if you own 50% or greater of more than one entity, it's deemed aggregated. The significance of the aggregation means that you must add all the employees together of both those entities. Okay. Um, under the PPP CARES loan, they did indeed um, provide certain, um, certain groups an exception from the aggregation rule. The exception really has to do with um, areas that they've highlighted as probably they're most concerned about. Accommodation and food services. So we gave the example of hotels last time. SBA approved franchises. There's a list of franchises that are approved by the SBA. Happy to share if you need it and then small businesses that receive financing through the small business investment company. The other thing we would point out is, again, there is no personal guarantee required for the PPPC loan and no collateral is required. Um, for the period for the IDA loan, they adjust the collateral um, that was needed under Section 1110 of the CARA Act, and they actually remove the requirement that the applicant must be able to obtain credit elsewhere for this period from January 31st to December 31st. 
They also said um, between January 31st and December 31st, they will only require a personal guarantee on loans greater than 200,000. So under 200,000, no personal guarantee. Um, we already uh, talked a lot about the maximum loan amount for the PPP. I would just highlight for the idle, um, the maximum loan amount is 2 million and it's based on the size and type of business and its financial resources. Um, while the care loans do indeed have debt forgiveness, forgiveness they have no advancement. Um, and as Jason talked about earlier, the idle loan is providing you an advancement. If you apply for an idle loan, whether or not you receive it, as long as you certify you're a business that was eligible to apply for an idle loan, not more than three days, am I right, Jason, is it three days? Three days, yep. After the application, you will get $10,000, um, and you do not have to pay that $10,000 back, okay? It's for you to use to help you get through this hard time. Um, interest rates, not that far off. If you're under a um, PPC loan, uh, you're gonna, a PPP loan, excuse me, is gonna be not to exceed 4%. Idle is 3.75% for small businesses or 2.75% for nonprofits. Um, for the PPC loan, the maturity is only 10 years, um, mainly because they expect to forgive the bulk of that. Um, for an idle loan, it's 30. Um, for an idle loan, you can defer your principal payments up for one, to one year. For a PPC loan, you're able to defer your principal interest and fees for at least six months, but not more than one year. So keep in mind on that, if you have the PPP loan, you would likely have the full loan forgiveness, as Lynn noted, before any of the payments begin to uh, take effect. And one thing that I'll point out, again, when we talk about principal repayment period on the idle loans, it can be up to 30 years. The SBA may not initially offer you a term of 30 years. They're going to offer a term that they feel is appropriate based on the information that they have. But you are allowed to go back and request different terms. And we expect the SBA to be fairly generous in terms of providing favorable repayment terms. Um, and what we've been hearing is it's likely that the one year deferral principle is going to be automatic with any application. But in the event that that it doesn't happen that way, you can request deferral of principal for up to a year, and we expect the SBA to, again, be generous with their ability to do that. That's why we have experts. <laughs> There's our expert. Um, what can I use uh, the loan funds for? Very similar, we're not gonna go into specifics right here, but very similar between the PPP and the IDLE program. Um, will the loan be forgiven? Um, again, for the PPC, the loan will be forgiven, um, but you have to use it accordingly within eight weeks from the loan origination date for very specific things, one being payroll costs, um, covered mortgage, covered rent, covered utilities. Um, are there limitations on the loan forgiveness? We've already covered them. Watch your FTEE count. If it did take a significant dip, you got to try to get it back to full employment by June 30th to avoid um, the decrease in your loan forgiveness. Um, also, be careful if you reduce salaries for any employee who makes $100,000 or less annually. How do you apply for the PPC loan? You go to the bank. How do you apply for the IDA loan? You go directly to this website. It was launched last night at 10 p.m. And based on Jason's um, research and, and application process, he said it, it only took him 10 minutes. I'm going to let him speak about it a little bit because he went through it today. Yeah, so when it's it's much, much, much simpler than what we had before. Um, I'm sure everyone out there was really looking forward to getting into all that paperwork we talked about last week and going through the checklist. And sorry to disappoint everyone that the process has been made simpler. But uh, yes, the SBA opened this portal last night around 10 o'clock and it, it'll be the easiest loan application that probably most of you have ever filled out. It's essentially four pages. There's a page where you have to make you know, check a, a few boxes that ensure that you are an eligible business. There's basic information about the business, you know, business name, address, EIN, things of that nature. The only type of financial information that you will need before you go to fill in this application is go into your general ledger and print out your profit and loss statement for the period starting February 1st of 2020 and ending, I apologize, 
February 1st of 2019 and ending January 31st of 2020. What they're going to want to see is they're going to want you to put in your, your sales for the trailing 12 months for the period ending in January of 2020. And you're also going to have to put expense information. It would be either cost of goods sold, or if you're a nonprofit, then you would want to put in um, basically your organizational cost as a nonprofit. And if you are a owner of rental real estate, you have to put in the amount of rent that you expect to not be able to collect as a result of COVID-19. That's the only financial information that you need. The rest of the information is basically kind of basic knowledge about your business, when the business started, who the owners are, social security numbers, names, addresses, things like that. All stuff that should be pretty basic. I did it in 10 minutes last night, um, but I'm a slow typer. I've heard some people can do it in five. So um, there's your goal. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is it's much, much easier than what it was before. At the very end of the application, right before you go to certify under penalty of perjury that you filled it all in accurately to the best of your ability, you'll see there's a checkbox where you check the box that you want to be considered for the $10,000 advancement. So please make sure you don't miss that. Remember to check that box so you get your $10,000. And then you put in your banking information, account number, routing number. You certify. You sign it virtually by you know checking yes. And, th and that's essentially it. And, and then you're going to be in the system. And again, we as we said last week, we expect the SBA to streamline the, the process of approving these loans. I think a big reason why they did this is, is one, of course, to make it easier on businesses, which is great. But also, I think once a combination of the fact that once CARES came out and modified some of the provisions that Lynn mentioned, where you know they don't need to look at certain documents, they don't need to collect personal guarantees, they don't need to check for other um, financing sources that the combination of that and the fact that it was going to be just very difficult for them from a resources standpoint to go through all of that paperwork that we talked about last week for thousands and thousands of thousands of businesses that are applying for these loans. I think they realized over the weekend that, that hey, our old application that we have really doesn't work anymore. We need to come up with something simpler so that we can get money to people faster so that we as the SBA can actually process these loans effectively and get money into people's hands. And I think the changes that they've made will go a long way in making that happen. We're excited. We're excited. It's, it's quicker. We're excited about the $10,000 advancement. Um, there's a lot of great things going on in the IDLE program. Again, I'm just going to reiterate that when you go to that website, that will take you five to 10 minutes. Make sure, as uh, Jason said, to print out um, your P&L um, again from um, February, let me see if I can get it right, February 1st of 2019 through January 31st of 2020. Um, make sure you have your sales and cost of goods sold. Um, all great information. Um, as far as the PPP CARES loan, what documentation is required? Obviously, the banks are going to want to see something regarding your payroll, right? Because your payroll is going to be times monthly average payroll times two and a half is going to create your loan amount. Um, they're probably going to dictate that. Uh, but they were very specific for self-employed individuals, independent contractors, and sole proprietors seeking a covered loan. Um, they'll need to include documentation or bring documentation, um, such as things that were uh, IRS filings, Form 1099 miss, and income expenses from the sole proprietorship. Um, so work with your bank regarding specific um, items if you're not a sole proprietor that they're going to want to see for those PPPC, PPP care loans. Um, again, we're just going to highlight that um, site. It was um, provided last night at 10 o'clock. It's the easy way to do it. Um, please ensure that that's the way you're going through this process. Um, another item we just want to point out before we give you a bank update, um, we still have a lot of people out there. When you do look at the aggregation rules, they are over 500 and they are frustrated. They have employees that they need to help. Um, they have businesses they're trying to run and they're not quite sure what they're getting. I'd like to highlight section 4003, which is also included in the CARES Act. It's a mid-sized loan relief. Um, it is eligible for businesses, including not-for-profit organizations, um, with employees between 500 and 10,000. There is no debt forgiveness relation related to section 4003 mid-sized loans, but there is some benefit. 
Um, they are telling you that the direct loans um, cannot have a higher interest annualized interest rate than 2% per year. That's huge. That's a great, it's small, but it, I mean, it's a huge benefit. Um, and for at least the first six months, um, no principal or interest can be made paid to be due and payable. Um, in addition, you'll have to make a good faith certification. You might have heard this on the news. They talked about you can't do buybacks with these loans. Um, you can't um, outsource employees outside the U.S. with these loans. So there is a good faith certification that's included in there, um, which if you need more detail, feel free to contact us. Um, also, um, the other thing that we'll point out to you, besides the loan amounts, um, if you don't take the PPP loan, um, you have some ability to delay your payment for employer taxes and also um, if you've had a significant decline in gross receipts or have had to shut down because of the COVID virus, there potentially is a payroll tax credit. We're not going to get into that today. We have a separate webinar later this week to talk about it. But those are the things that mid to large size um, businesses should be looking at. At this point, I'm going to pass it over to Mark to give you a bank update. Hi, everyone. I'm going to keep this really brief. So over the past three days, I've talked to about a dozen banks and credit unions in the area. And as highlighted in our chart, the SBA has delegated its authority for the PPP loans, the CARES, the CARES Act loans, to directly to the banks, starting with approved SBA lenders. After that, they, there is the ability for the Treasury and the SBA to approve additional lenders. And these could include credit unions and other small uh, community banks that are not currently SBA lenders, along with SBICs and BDCs. So my point of advice to you at this point, having had a conversation with a few dozen, a dozen plus banks and credit unions, the best starting point for this application is the bank or credit union that you currently work with if they are participating in the program. If they're an SBA lender, they likely have a process in place already. Many or all are still waiting on further guidance from, from the SBA on what specifically they need. But as Lynn talked about and we highlighted in our comparison chart, you know, 941s are a must. That's your payroll tax filing form, recent payroll records, at least for the last year probably, and likely some internal financials. I've seen a list, uh, you know, each bank will have their own underwriting standards, which are likely consistent with what they typically do. But with the 100% guarantee of the SBA, they're likely won't be as stringent as they may have been previously for loans without that guarantee. With that, you'll likely want to have a few years of financials available if requested. But again, the takeaway here is the best starting point is your current relationship, bank or credit union. If they're not participating, we have begun to assemble a list in each of our practice markets and have contacts ready to uh, send you to. So, Clients of the banks will be first in line, but we, uh, we're ready to help you find a connection. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I just want to reiterate, don't wait, um, guys. If you are looking to do a PPP loan, please reach out to your banks. They know you. They know your business. This is the relationship that you've been building for years with them. It's important that you know, um, that you're working together as a team, as obviously you're working together with your advisors as well at the Bonadio Group or, or wherever you may lie. The next thing I want to do real quick before we wrap it up tonight um, is that we've had some frequently asked questions that we wanted to highlight and give you our thoughts on them. Um, one has to do with, they refer to nonprofit organizations in the CARES bill, um, specifically under the PPP uh, loan, how is that defined? I think it's really important. Um, we have a large nonprofit practice, um, and it is very specific as to the nonprofit that they are willing to give the PPP loan to, and it is only 501c3 organizations. It does not include 501c5 or 501c4, and essentially those were just examples I was giving you. Um, it only includes 501c3 organizations. Lynn, before you move on, I will point out that 
Again, this is one of the areas where IDLE and CARES differs. IDLE does have a little bit of expanded eligibility in terms of nonprofits. In addition to 501c3s, it's also available to 501d or 501e organizations. Perfect. So 501d or 501e organizations are allowed to IDLE, right? Is that what I heard? That's okay. correct. So that's, that's great news. Um, in addition, if I take the CARES PPP loan, can I also receive the employee payroll tax retention credit? Um, essentially, that's something we referred to earlier for mid to large size businesses. But essentially, if you take a PPP loan, there is no payroll tax credit you're going to be able to get under the CARES Act. Um, essentially, what they've said is if you received, if you have greater uh, than a 50% reduction in the quarter related to your gross receipts, or you've had a um, close or partially closed because of COVID, they would allow you up to 50% of your employee uh, employer taxes to be credited. And essentially, they make it very clear that if you've received a loan under the PPP program, that is not available to you. And there's a lot of confusion regarding that, so we just want to make sure that's clear. In addition, um, there's a big deferral of your payroll tax payment. Um, essentially, from now until the end of the year, um, you can um, defer your o OASDI um, payroll taxes for your employee, and you can pay them over the next two years, December 31st, 2021, and December 31st, 2022, 50% on each of those days, each of those time periods. And so a lot of people are excited about the deferral payment, but you should know that if you look for debt forgiveness on, due to your PPP loan, which I think the vast majority of us will be, um, you are not available for that payroll tax deferral, and there will be a clawback meaning maybe you didn't go after the PPP loan at first and you started deferring your taxes and then later you do get the PPP loan, um, they will require you um, to, pay, to, to, to um, deal with the clawback provision. Um, if a business pays out commissions to people on 1099s, can they include those on, um, when trying to determine their payroll for the, for the CARES PPP loan? I know we have talked about it a lot, but just so we're clear, yes, you can. Um, don't forget to include those monthly average payments that you pay to independent contractors, sole proprietors, et cetera, um, when determining what your um, pay, average monthly payroll is. Um, this is a big one we've already talked about, but please know that there is an aggregation rule that applies to both IDLE and PPP loans. It is extremely broad. Um, this is the example that I will read to you. It says SBA can consider factors such as ownership, management, previous relationship with or ties to another concern, and contractual relationships in determining whether affiliation exists. It is very clear that if you have a 50% or greater ownership, you are affiliated for these rules. But it's much more than that. In addition, the SBA will consider the totality of the circumstances and may find affiliation even though no single factor is sufficient to constitute affiliation. That's where I'm saying that's a pretty gray area. I don't know how strict the SBA is going to be in this area based on the circumstances that exist today, but it is important for you to be aware. Again, accommodation and food services, SBA approved franchise, and certain small businesses who receive financing through the Small Business Investment Company do not um, have the aggregation rules. What happens if I don't use my full PPC loan within the eight weeks in which after the loan origination date? Essentially, anything that wasn't utilized or forgiven um, means that you will go into a maturity date of, um, of a maximum of 10 years and that you'll have a loan interest rate not to exceed 4%. What if I already had a bank loan that I entered into um, between January 31st and now, and now I want to go after the PPC loan? Can I roll that into my PPP loan? The answer is no. Okay. The only item that you can roll, loan that you can roll into your PPP loan is an SBA loan that you took out after January 31st. So we wanted to provide some clarity on that. I think we've killed it to death, but just one more time, applications for the PPP CARES loan, are, it, it, you go through your bank, it's a different application than the SBA IDLE loan. Jason has highlighted wonderfully that the SBA IDLE loan has gotten much, much quicker um, and that it's a much more simpler process than what we talked about last week.
What if a business already had a layoff or furlough? Can they still qualify for loan forgiveness under the PPP CARES loan? i just like to highlight here, if they had layoffs or furloughs, that doesn't necessarily impact greatly the amount of loan they're allowed to take out as a PPP, because you're going to look at the past 12 months, look at your average payroll, and multiply it by 2.5%. However, when you have now, right, when you're ready to get your loan forgiven, there is a specific clause which we already spent a lot of time on that says if your full-time employee equivalent count went down compared to two different testing dates, then essentially that might reduce your loan forgiveness. However, there is a clause in the CARES bill that seems to reflect that if you go back up to 100% in your FTEE count by June 30th, they will ignore that reduction provision. So keep that in mind. Um, we've had a fair number of questions regarding temporary agencies and the use of temp workers. Um, I think it, it's a facts and circumstances test. Um, most temporary agencies act as the employer to the temporary agents, meaning that they have full direction over them, um, they cut their W-2s, and, and when they give a company a temp agent, the temp agent is purely um, there under the temporary agency's discretion. So essentially, if that's the case, that it would, in our uh, limited area of understanding, because we have no more additional guidance, to me personally, it would look like that temporary agent was an employee of the temporary agency and not an employee of the person that was hiring them for the temporary work. And so that would have an impact on your employee count, um, which could be a good thing, um, but that would also have an impact on the amount of payroll you're allowed to look at um, for purposes of determining your maximum loan amount. Um, before we end, I'm going to just pause for a second and ask if Mark or Jason have any additional comments or questions. Mark always has a question. No, I do not actually have additional <laughs> questions at this time. Um, I guess I just want to reiterate that you know, things are moving rapidly. The law was signed last Friday, and now that we have more clarity, uh, we've made our recommendations, I think, here today in, in this webinar. And we think um, you know, actively pursuing the PPP loan, if you qualify, is a great course of action along with the idle. Uh, remembering the caveats that the payroll uh, deferral and payroll payroll tax deferral along with the payroll tax 50% write off is not will not be available to you. And I think the, the other thing that I'd like to point out is, you know, as we saw last night, things are changing very quickly here. They're going to continue to change quickly, but I want to assure everyone out there that we are on this. We're looking at it every day. And as things change, we're going to make sure we communicate them to you and get you the latest and greatest information. Um, we know it's important to everybody out there to get this funding, to keep their business going, and to get through this crisis. And we're here to help. And I would just like to thank, you know, we're so fortunate to have a team um, at the Bonadio Group who has put all hands in on deck to help our client base and to help our community. Um, we're so fortunate to have a culture and a firm that understands the importance of really helping our community get through this crisis. Um, again, um, on a personal note, we thank all um, the essential employees from the medical providers to the transporters and the trucks to our workers at the grocery store. Um, we are so fortunate to have you helping us throughout this entire process. And if this is all we can do for our small part during this, this pandemic, um, we're happy to do it. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out to us to let us help you um, navigate these rules. Um, that's what we do. Um, and obviously, um, we have a team of people who have been combing through them um, to try to make sure we get you the right answer. I would reiterate, though, that today is Monday, March 30th. Sometimes I have to check. Um, and essentially, things are rapidly changing. And this is our update for you as of Monday, March 30th. And as we continue to progress, we will make sure to either have additional um, recordings such as this or additional client alerts um, that go out to you. So we wish you the best of luck out there. Um, we would reiterate, we know we are going to get through this as a country, um, and we are excited um, to be there to greet you um, on the other side of this. Have a great night.